So yesterday we were looking at uh, uh, continuation of the Randolph syndrome model. So we were okay. Uh, we were trying to solve the problem of how to stabilize the braking system. Okay. So two brains which are supposed to collapse with each other, okay, uh, because they have opposite tensions and they are localized at a point KRC. So once the basic idea is that you have an IR brain and a UV brain, or this is also called visible and hidden. And along the way, what we saw was that um, that if we have a bulk scalar, if we have a bulk scalar, the zero mode uh, is delocalized. Interaction is zero mode is delocalized unless you put in the mass terms on the on the brain. Essentially, you put in the mass terms on both the brains, and then so you end up having a zero mode, which you can localize it either this side or that side, depending upon the sign of the okay. Either you want the UV brain or on the IR brain. Okay. This will be useful later on. With once I discuss uh, uh, a little bit of this. The second point we saw was that. If have interactions, if you have interactions on the brains, so if you put in uh, interactions here, say lambda phi 4, lambda phi 4, and you localize these interaction terms, so remember that you are, uh, this normally we don't see it in field theory, but uh, meaning four dimensional field. But in actual dimensions, you have localized interactions. You can localize them at a particular space time point, essentially. So you are localizing them on this brain. So you have localized interactions on this brain. Sometimes you are called brain localized interaction, brain localized mass terms. Okay? So, <coughs> and uh, so these brain localized uh, interaction terms, they generate a potential. This potential will stabilize the, uh, the radius system. The radius, with uh, roughly given by the k r is given by some uh, some function log b c by b hidden plus b something like this. Some function, some constant. Okay. This is odd one. Okay. Some constant. So it can be localized. So if you want, this would be something like m square and k square, some constant and this is So this, so last model solves, you have, okay, uh, you can stabilize the brains. So now we can actually do, put the entire standard model on the brains, okay. So the first model, which solves the hierarchy problem, is called RS1. It's to be called as one model, in which the setting is that you have only gravity in the bulk, and the entire standard model Lagrangian is multiplied by delta uh, y is equal to five. Is localized on the IR. gravity in the bulk and make the cosmos constant. Okay. So including the Higgs, everything resides here. This model, this model is strongly constrained by a little function this is. To understand this, Let us see how graviton is localized in this picture. Okay, how the graviton is localized in this picture. So, 
given by x is a d power phi x minus two two m q now root minus three is equal to e power minus four sigma y and d medium is equal to e power minus three sigma theta medium plus h medium d s mu d s mu minus d s mu so what i did was that uh, to derive the graviton localization I expanded linearly g minimum in terms of g minimum, like what we did earlier also, is equal to eta minimum plus h minimum. We did the same thing in the flat extra dimensions, so we'll do the same thing here also. So then you can write the five dimensional vertex scalar as four dimensional vertex scalar plus g mu phi r mu phi plus d phi phi r phi phi then this vicky scalar is given in terms of this uh, various uh, Christopher symbols this is the Riemann tensor Uh, the same formula in which in gr there's no difference this is the gr formula so from riemann and geometry you can write down the riemann tensor and everything okay so these things you don't have to calculate by hand but you can run it and uh, calculate everything by this <coughs> so when you do all that stuff essentially you end up uh, Having uh, the various Christopher symbols and all the Christo uh, I mean, all the Christopher symbols and their derivatives, you can derive them. I can give the formula, but I just upload it in the Teams page. So after doing all that stuff, so all we need is the R formula, right? We all need is the, the five-dimension R. All we need is the five dimension R. So if you want to compute for this particular metric, what is the five dimension R? So you can compute it by using these formulas essentially. What is the five dimension R? Because the five dimension R is four dimension R plus G mu nu mu phi plus G phi phi R phi phi, everything essentially. So you can compute it. Now what you do is H mu nu of x y because it is five dimensional it's one by root pi r you write it in terms of the modes h mu nu of n x chi n of y you again factorize it in terms of x and y like what we did for the k expansion so this is like uh, what we need is what is a zero mode graviton and what is its profile. For the zero mode graviton, that represents your Einstein gravity. The zero mode graviton represents your Einstein gravity and where it's localized, essentially where it's localized in the middle time or the higher time. So you put this back. Then you have the equation of motion, uh, uh, the action, four dimensional effective action is given after integrating out in five, uh, the fifth dimension. Okay, this mean of n x n mean uh, 
derivative test. Point is you have to choose a gauge. The gauge would be H D mu is equal to zero, and then mu H D mu is equal to this transverse Lorentz gauge V6 V6. And then the wave functions chi satisfy the equation V by dy equal minus four sigma V by dy chi of Also do the same thing like we have to do. Uh, we have to go, th uh, go through this uh, rigmarole essentially that we use the uh, orthonormality regulation. Same thing like what we are doing earlier. Because we have e power 2 sigma, we can canonically normalize it. And when you do canonical normalization of the profile wave functions, so you have del y chi tilde at n, chi tilde at n is equal to delta m n, where this chi tilde is equal to e power minus sigma chi. Now you solve this for mn is equal to 0. Okay. Solve this equation again for mn is equal to 0. And the general solution for mn is equal to 0. This is essentially your Einstein gravity. Something. Don't have to take it. Uh, chi 0 of y, the general solution will be just some constant okay, plus another constant e power 2 sigma y. Now, if you choose the Neumann boundary conditions, Neumann means the derivative of the wave function should vanish at the boundary conditions, at 0 and pi r. Uh, choosing Neumann boundary conditions. So the only thing which will derivative if the derivative should vanish, that means a is equal to zero. A one is equal to zero. Sorry, a one is equal to zero. So you are just left with a constant profile. You are just left with a constant profile for chi is equal to zero. But if you canonically normalize the chi, you have to multiply with e power sigma, e power minus sigma. So when you do chi zero canonically normalize chi z, chi tilde of zero of y is some normalization function times e power minus sigma of y. So what does this mean? The profile of the wave function just follows the what factor. It just follows the what factor. So it is peak at the UV plane. It is peak at the UV plane and falls off at the IR plane. So it has peaking here. So the so the graviton is strongly coupled to the UV and extremely weakly coupled in the other. So this explains 
why gravity is weak in the sun. So if you want in terms of the hierarchy of forces, you want to ask the question why is gravity weak in the standard model or why is gravity weak uh, you know, for the four forces, okay? It is because, okay, you can think that the profile in the extra dimension, okay, <laughs> you are satisfied of the graviton field is such that it falls off, it follows a warp factor and it falls off in this manner. So this explains why gravity is weak. Gravity is weak in four dimensions. In four dimensions, the gra gravitational field is extremely weak. But it could be very strongly coupled in the fifth dimension at the other frame. Okay, in the UV frame, it could be very strongly coupled. Because it has a large overlap, essentially. Okay, it's magnetically coupled. <coughs> but what about KK gravitons? Okay, KK gravitons solve a completely different equation of motion. This is similar to the scalar field equation we have seen, except that now it has two instances. satisfy the equation exactly like what we did yesterday. We define a new variable z square del square by z zn square plus zn times z and zn zn square times two two power minus two sigma y pi of twenty Some normalization factor, so here z of zn first time and r pi of y z zn. This is of the second kind of special. And mn typically has a solution m plus. These are the masses of the KK gravitons, very similar to the expressions we had for the bulk scalar field, essentially. Okay, but these KK gravitons couple very strongly to the fields on the IR. Okay, their wave functions are localized towards the IR. Okay, their wave functions. When you solve this, uh, you know, uh, this Bessel's function and their solutions. And the solutions are given in terms of this Bessel function. Okay. So these are essentially localized towards the IR. So they couple very, very strongly to the fields in the IR. Okay. They couple very, very strongly to the fields in the IR. Now this coupling, how does this coupling go?
about as a terrible term couple in go. L interaction is given by an effective Lagrangian m power 3 by 2, this is m plan to which we have t alpha beta of x h alpha beta. So this is nothing but h alpha beta at y is plus beta. h alpha beta is a wave function or the graviton wave function y is equal to y r, which we know what we can do essentially. So this essentially is equal to 1 by m plan t alpha beta of x h alpha beta of 0 1 by t is square this is nothing but your mn plus with mn t alpha beta of x sum over h alpha beta so it couples to the <coughs> to the energy momentum tensor like what we have seen from the beginning but this coupling is large because first of all it is not suppressed to the open at plan scale it is suppressed by dv scale so this scale is roughly dv because we put the ir brain at the dv so this is the mass brain of the uh, the scale of the dv brain secondly the overlap of this wave function is very very large as we have seen h alpha beta has chi n which peaks towards the ir brain okay this overlap of the wave function is very very large so this coupling so this is contains all the standard model fields okay T alpha beta contains all the standard model fields because it's the energy momentum tensor of the fields. So this alpha beta is uh, T alpha beta is standard model, so you can put whatever when we wrote down no? all the Lagrangian, we can put the entire Lagrangian essentially. Okay, psi bar, sigma mu, all del flash, essentially all standard model fields. So everything you can put it here essentially. You put it here and then del mu, del mu, everything. But then this h alpha beta, we know what the solution is. The solution is hn chi n of pi is equal to pi r, okay? Okay? which is very, very large. This coupling is very, very large essentially. Chi n of pi, y, uh, chi n of chi n has wave function which is given by the Bessel's function and this is very very large. So all the standard model particles coupled very strongly with the KK graviton, RS graviton. Okay? All the standard model particles coupled very strongly to the RS graviton. Suppressed by what? T V scale. Roughly. Suppressed by only the T V scale. So instead of Planck scale suppression, you will have 1 by T V scale. Essentially. So what is the problem? So what is the problem? So first of all, you have direct uh, KK searches and everything. Okay. So I'll come to the KK searches uh, and colliders and everything because then you'll have like we had, what we had drawn. You can write uh, um, uh, Feynman rules, couplings of the Feynman rules, the same set of Feynman rules, but now with uh, the wave functions which are different. Just like EDD models, we had written all the Feynman rules, right? Essentially, the same kind of Feynman rules you can write down here also. Very similar Feynman rules.
So you would expect collider searches. I'll tell you the latest numbers. Collider searches of KK Graviton. Searches. So there is a limit on K. Like I said, uh, cannot cut off trail of the model to deviate to essentially K should be less than or equal to uh, 40 times M blank. This is just parameter or this is nothing but the curvature. I'll come to areas. So CMS gives you uh, between because K can vary from 1 to 40 M plan. Okay, you can choose K to be between 150 and 40 M plan. So CMS gives you a limit of the order of uh, 2.3 to 4.6. Okay, it's not very strong essentially. This is uh, from gamma gamma final states, diphoton. Then uh, uh, EE and mu mu channels, these are on 4.6. Okay, roughly these are the essential numbers essentially. So you get 2.4 to 4.78 or something essentially. So EE, mu mu. New new final states, CMS will give you maximum 2.7 to 4.8. Roughly, this is in the ballpark between 2 and 4 TV, 4 and a half TV. Okay, this is the limits from C CMS on KK Graviton. KK Graviton produced releases to uh, photons or to electrons or to muons, and that's it. Now these limits are not the important ones. The important ones which kill the RS model on uh, this uh, where all the standard model fields are localized on the brain, but none of the fields are localized on the uh, uh, traveling in the bulk. It was killed by electroweak questions. Okay, that model is no longer favorable unless you solve the problem of electroweak questions. Okay. So this brain localized stand, uh, RS model, okay, which nobody pursues now anymore. This is called. This is killed by electrolytic questions. This, I think, initially I gave a small lecture on electroweak question test, right? Essentially, telling you that uh, what are electroweak question test. Electroweak question test are uh, just to recap. Uh, these are observables measured. And 
various other experiments also, but dominantly by left experiment, okay, at the Z point. So when you run the machine at a resonance, you produce millions of these Zs. So you can actually make a very systematic and very precise measurements of <coughs> MW, MZ, 91.2, mm -hmm. gamma Z, gamma Z into EE, gamma Z into E mu, gamma Z into all BB, so on and so You can measure all the partial limits very, very well. And gamma Z immutable. This you may learn in your standard model class, actually. Okay? And then you also have measurements on science quotated energy. And MW to a certain extent, not so much. And so on, so on, so on. So there are various partial limits also. Various measurements, bunch of measurements, essentially, which you keep at, at, this, uh, at this level. So you can test your standard model, but more than these observables, what you want is essentially that if you have a bunch of new particles, say for example, especially for strongly interacting fields, say for example. So ADS, the Randall syndrome is a strongly interacting theory because it is like an ADS CFT theory, like, uh, okay, which is a weakly coupled gravity in four dimensions. Okay, uh, it's five dimensionally weak theory weakly coupled theory essentially, but five dimensional theory, four dimensional theory is a strongly coupled theory. Strongly coupled conformal field theory essentially. Okay? Five D ADS is equal to four D conformal field theory. Like ADS CFT, five D ADS weak is equivalent to four D conformal field theory. The conformal field theory is broken here in the standard model, okay, in the RS model, is broken by the brains, essentially. There are two brains localized, it's not sort of okay. So it's a strongly coupled theory. In this case, what are the best observables, essentially, like in technical error or any other theories, most of the theories, what are the best observables to study electroweak machine test? So these observables are given by Peskin and Takeuchi, go under the name STU. So these are a part of So I'll come to this uh, four parameters ST parameters Like I said, these are nothing but your uh, Self energies at a Z point. So S parameter is given by 16 pi mz square pi 3 p mz square minus pi 3 p 0 minus pi 3 
So this is also equal to sixteen five and z square pi three y at zero minus pi three y and z square. I'll tell you what this means in a second. The t parameter I use one more formula for the t parameter as c square c square and z square pi one one zero minus pi three three zero. And the u parameter actually there are not completely we don't have any constraints on from the u but anyway. Pi M W square pi one one M W square minus pi one one <coughs> zero minus sixteen pi in Z square pi three three M Z square. Minus pi three three. Now, what are these pi's? Pi's are the central angles. Okay. So W boson contains three components: W one, W two, W three. Okay. And then there is B, or B or Y. Which is a neutral component. This is a plus or minus. Okay, this is charge component. W one, W two are charge components. These two are neutral components. So I put a zero there. So these two mix. These two mix, giving you Z and gamma. Z and gamma. Now, at one loop level, at one loop level. You have corrections to these self energies through some process. Say, for example, some loop will come in which you'll have W one, W one, and you can also have W one, W two. Okay, but in all of these things, there are bunch. You can write all these self energies, right? W one, W two, W one, gamma, W one, so on, so you can all these come. Within all these combinations. What matters most? What matters most? Why you choose this particular thing is because each of there is some sort of a, uh, for example, this t parameter, t parameter. What matters most essentially is the difference between not one one and two two. Okay, one not one one and two two because they are almost same. Essentially, they are coming as a uh, doublet. Essentially. But the combinations of this thing W one W W one minus W three W one Z uh, meaning uh, W one and Z this is the main thing essentially which makes a difference or the mixing between the neutral components neutral components and Y okay the neutral component of W and Y and the mixing at at a one energy scale. Minus the renormalization, the difference in the renormalization at one energy, one energy scale to another scale, which is essentially Q square is equal to M square square. These things will make a huge difference. These are well measured. These are the ones which will make a huge difference. So, out of all possible electromagnetic uh, self energies, you choose ones which are the most important and the most sensitive to new physics. You choose those linear combinations which are sensitive to linear. You, these are the ones. These are the not the most. Now these coefficients in front, these linear combinations can differ in terms of the coefficients. Okay. Now I am using Pascal Takayuchi, but they are equally given by you know uh, other people also. There are x y z coordinates. There are epsilon one, epsilon two, epsilon three, epsilon four. Uh, 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 meaning. Combinations, so those depend upon what coefficients you use in front and what whether you put a cos theta here, cos theta w here, or not essentially. So how you take the linear combinations it doesn't matter. But the important ones are essentially 
your what your self analysis, the choice of the self analysis. Out of which the most important one is one of the most these two are important. S and T are very important compared to you. The T parameter is the one which measures the custodial signal. So let me start with T. Okay. So what is custodial signal? So what is custodial signal? In the standard model, m z square is equal to b square plus g prime square 1 by 4 b square. m w square is 1 by 4 g square. Okay? Now, if I take a ratio of these two, if I take a ratio of these two, what is it you will get? I will get a function of g square and g prime square essentially. Mw by mz is equal to g by root of g square plus g. This is nothing but cos theta. So this fixed custodial symbol as a statement is that this relation should be valid at the three level. And this relation should be valid by even at one loop first. It should not, okay, this relation should not be modified significantly. So sometimes you define some parameter, many times you define some parameter. And then you say rho is equal to 1. <laughs> rho is equal to 1. Then you say rho is equal to 1. The rho parameter, the rho parameter is nothing but the ratio of mz and mz, mw and mz. Because right hand side you know it very well. Cos theta w you know it very well. It's 1 minus sin square theta w square root, which is essentially around 0.77, square root of 0.77. So you just know this mass and you multiply that with uh, mz. So that essentially tells you that the mass of the mw is roughly 80% uh, of the mass of the z at z. That's what it tells you. Now, this means that somehow there are several statements essentially now. So there are so, so if you have any generic any generic theory, any generic theory in which a sub a sub two cross u one, only let's just take the u one y is broken to u one arithmetic. In any generic theory, because this is now very well measured. In any generic theory which has this S2 cross V1 Y breaking to U1 EM should satisfy this relation. It need not be the Higgs mechanism. It could be not be the double uh, whatever Higgs essentially is. Okay. Any new physics theory or any theory which incorporates S2 cross V1 to U1 EM should always satisfy this relation even at all orders and perturbations. Because this is very well measured, 
rho is very very close to 1 at left. So that means rho is measured up to 0 0.02 percent. Unbelievable. Something like that. Okay? It is actually 0 0.004 or something. So the per at the percentage level, I think it's 0 0.02 percent. So that means any corrections to it also should be so small, okay, that this relation should have this value. Now this relation will depend upon what is the kind of Higgs representations you use, okay? What is the kind of whether you are breaking with a triplet, this relation will be completely changed. Okay? If you are breaking with a strongly if you are okay, <coughs> so this relation is very, very important actually. So the reason is, what happens in standard model where this is uh, uh, applicable? Uh, I'll just write down the uh, mass matrix. In the sun, so any theory, any theory which breaks in this chain. So what we need should satisfy this relation. So what we need is, is there any some symmetry argument which will do this? Is there any symmetry argument which can? symmetry argument comes by identifying that if you write a mass matrix say for example w1, w2, w3 and uh, I don't know z or whatever you want to write as g, b should always have this structure. of this, there are three Goldstone bosons, okay? That means three Goldstone bosons should always get a mass. So anything you should, okay, first of all, this mass matrix has how many, this mass matrix has a determinant zero. So that means one of the eigenvalues is zero, okay? It has an eigenvalue, this is, so you can see it easily, this determinant is zero. So it has one of the eigenvalues zero. The other two eigenvalues are mz square, mw square, and zero. So what is the symmetry under which this mass matrix is made? So the vacuum should always conserve electromagnetic theory. The vacuum should always conserve electromagnetic theory. That means one of the eigenvalues should always be zero. So instead of Higgs, if you have some other web sitting here, say for example in the neutral component, the structure of the mass matrix should always insist that the determinant should go to zero. So it should always come like this. 
So that means these two, these two have an SU2 symmetry essentially. These two have an SU2 symmetry. That means if you interchange them, they should give you the same formula essentially. Okay? These two are okay, or even symmetry essentially, or SU not even essentially. A pseudo symmetry. <coughs> Sorry, this is O2 symmetry, right? This is O2 because these are real, actually. Yeah, this is O2 symmetry. So they have an O2 symmetry. So that means it's a human symmetry. Now, if you insist that this, 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 all of them go, that means it's an a pseudo symmetry. Essentially. Now, how is this correct in the standard model? Because in the standard model, we have mu h dagger h plus lambda h dagger h whole square. Now you set the Ikawa's to zero, gauge coupling to zero. So if you set the gauge coupling to zero, there is a u four symmetry. Okay, there is a u four symmetry because all these terms are zero. So there is a large SU4 symmetry. In the standard model, that SU4 symmetry because all the masses come from where as a Boltzmann model. Okay? In the, in the standard model, if you take G G prime equal to zero, Y is equal to zero, the kinetic terms are there, but the uh, covariant derivatives are zero, Yukawa couplings are zero. In that limit, what you have is a pure electronic symmetry breaking sector. Is a pure electronic symmetry breaking sector. This has not just a SU2 cross U1 symmetry, it has an additional global symmetry, which is SO4. Which is SO4, which is because H1, H is equal to real phi plus imaginary phi plus real phi zero plus imaginary phi zero. So these are thought of as four, four real scalar fields. So this is SO4 symmetry. And SO4 symmetry, or you can rewrite it as SO2L times SO2R symmetry. Global symmetry. This symmetry is protecting the mass matter should be of the same form essentially. So all these four gauge bosons, their longitudinal moves because they get their masses only after the electronic symmetry breaking. Okay, their longitudinal moves arise only after they get masses. So that means they are associated with the Boltzmann modes of these fields essentially. So these Boltzmann modes are associated with the Higgs fields essentially. That Boltzmann equivalence theorem. W3 you can replace it with, uh, wherever there are Boltzmann bosons, you can replace it with the Higgs field, uh, Boltzmann modes, right, essentially. The massive modes are there, you can replace it with the Higgs fields. So that's called the Boltzmann equivalence theorem. If you want, you can check it in Cheng and Lee or something essentially. Yeah. So that means that there is this symmetry which is SO4, which is protecting the structure of the mass matrix, which is protecting the structure of the mass matrix, and protecting this in turn leaves you with rho is equal to 1. In turn leaves you with rho is equal to 1. Now, you can write it in terms of current current expectation values, essentially. So you show that <coughs> uh, this, this symmetry is called the custodial symmetry. Anyway, I can go in greater details. I have a complete lecture notes on this, yeah, but I will leave it at, at it is because otherwise I will not finish this lecture. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this. Um, so any new symmetry, anything, if you want, uh, any new model which incorporates electronic symmetry. Should satisfy at the tree level as well as at the one loop level, such that this symmetry should be only softly broken. 
but the gauge couplings are improper. That's all. It should be there. It should conserve the same density. Okay. There is no such symmetry with S parameter. S parameter is only sensitive. Okay. Only sensitive to uh, the compositeness or uh, comp uh, or essentially it. Uh, S parameter is uh, sensitive to uh, quote unquote non perturbative effect essentially. Okay. The compositeness of uh, this, uh, the particles essentially. So the, uh, if we have uh, anything which breaks the chiral structure of the standard model, S parameter is sensitive. Okay, S parameter is sensitive. So for example, if you anything which changes with P three L, that's a the left handed P three, okay, of the S parameter, then the S parameter is sensitive. Whereas the row parameter is the one which tells you how the breaking should change between uh, the U one Z and S U two breaking. So U and Z part of the SU2 breaking essentially. That's basically the idea. So the SS value with U is equal to zero is close to 0 0.03. These are all very close values essentially. Okay, in standard model with the Higgs contribution essentially. And the T is rho is very, very close to one. Uh, I'll write T in terms of uh, The row parameter is just alpha times rho. Oh, see, let me write the value this is 0 0.01 plus minus 0.12. And uh, you can just u is equal to 0 0.5 plus minus 0 0.10. Typically, you choose u is equal to 0. That's it. These are only very logarithmically effective. So in that case, S is close to 0, 0 0.08. T is equal to 0 0.05 plus minus 0. So if you have a technical error model, okay, technical error model, it gives you a very large corrections to the S parameter. So technical error models were ruled out by S parameter because they give you uh, S roughly equivalent to PL, uh, PL I minus PI, PI, uh, P3, P3I, P3L, P3R, uh, yeah, essentially roughly something like this, remember correctly. So they give you a very large contribution with a positive S, so they rule it out essentially. Some more all I essentially. And let me see if I can define that. So then P uh, is equal to, or delta T, sometimes these are called delta T, it's an expression, alpha times the time. I think it's correct. Or rho is equal to alpha times T, sorry. Rho is equal to alpha times T. 
So the low parameter and the peak parameter are roughly the same. So your what's the problem with these models? Okay, RS one models with this STU parameter system. So they start giving you extremely large SLD values. They give you very large STU SLD values from corrections coming from the strongly coupled graviton fields. Strongly coupled graviton fields, the KK gravitons. The KK gravitons violate the custodial symmetry. Now, how do you compute these corrections in KK gravitons? Easily, you couple the couple the things and compute the loops. But loops computation is very hard. So, what you do is you estimate from higher dimensional operators. Okay. So, you take six dimensional operators which couple to uh, the Higgs, say, for example. So, what are the Higgs? Del mu, H diagram H. And so you have all this bunch of operators which contribute to its density parameters. So from these operators you can calculate okay, uh, the SLTU parameters. I think you can study from any of these present day lectures, but I think the original paper by Gerichstein and Wise, the same Wise, okay. This is a nice paper actually. Winston and Wise, which came soon after Peskin's paper, essentially. Okay, um, I'll try to put it. Uh, our our, our uh, IIC doesn't have a subscription for this. Okay, but uh, we can put the kick. Uh, I'll try to put it in the in the team's page, or I'll send you. Whoever wants references, just write to me. I'll just share the Dropbox for you. Of all the things. So there are this bunch of operators. Now you estimate these operators, corrections to these operators, okay, through the SLTU parameters. Now how do you estimate these operators? Higher dimension corrections to these operators. Okay. These coefficients have to be computed essentially. So to compute the coefficients, there are several ways essentially. There are you can use ADS CFT ways or you explicitly compute by diagrams. Okay? So use Typically, one estimates this with some coefficients. You can estimate this with some coefficients by writing down the phi mu nu in uh, x mu y plane. Okay, corrections to this. Okay, you can use five dimensional methods, but okay. There are various methods to calculate it, uh, uh, but typically these are essentially. Uh, okay, sorry, I'm trying this one. You have graviton graviton corrections coming from here. Okay, so you have this insert the graviton graviton corrections here and correct W mu W mu. So similarly, you have Z, insert the graviton current essentially, Z, 
और b Sorry, it should be z gamma, okay, z z, or gamma by w. So you put in the graviton coupling here, essentially graviton source, and estimate these Wilson coefficients in terms of an FFP group. You integrate this thing, okay, you integrate this one, and that gives you what is the contribution to this Wilson coefficient essentially in terms of the FFP group. Now when you do all that stuff, what is the limit on the lambda you get? Lambda is greater than 20 to 40. So the RS model will not work at 1 degree. You need to push it much, much larger, 25 T, 30 T, so that the Closest estimates you can put it as for 20 TV, but you can actually, the limits are very, very small, essentially, around 20 to 40. So the electronic friction test tells you that all the fluids localized on the Higgs on the IR brain will not work. Okay? So people started looking at something called the bulk RS. So bulk RS is the model which we all study now essentially in which all the fields, okay, including uh, the Higgs, sometimes the Higgs can be localized or not, are traveling, all the fermions, all the gauge bosons. Essentially, the moment you put gauge bosons in the bulk, these limits get much, much better essentially. The basic idea is that you start putting gauge bosons in the bulk and then they start because you cannot put fermions and gauge bosons separately. So you put the gauge bosons and the fermions in the bulk, and that's how you get reduce the limits on the from the electronic friction test essentially. Even then the current the limits are not so weak. They are not they are still strong. They are about the five to six T V essentially. But you can bring it down now almost to one T V by some other mechanism. So for this, we need to see how the fermion fields and the gauge fields move in the bulk. Okay. Is it getting too tiresome for you guys? Bars. <laughs> Is it becoming too complicated or then I can just tell you the results and then, okay. Um, then we can move to something else, I don't know, some other ideas or something. So today I'll just tell, uh, okay. tell you uh, just uh, the final results for the gauge bosons and the fermions. Fermions is interesting because bulk RS is, now you can consider it as actually, this is something which we should all know. You can localize the fermions wherever you want, okay, in the bulk. That is important and that's interesting to know. No, it's a fermion brain. On anywhere near the brain. So, and the overlap of these wave functions, and you can use it to solve the flavor problem. So, you can actually say why you can equate it with uh, uh, so why the fermion masses are hierarchical. Mm -hmm. So, that problem is solved because you can choose your bulk masses such a way that they are localized at different places in the bulk brain. But the Yuka function is so the Higgs is localized on the IR brain. So the Yukawa will just become an overlap of these two wave functions localized on the brain 
so you can choose where it so, so if there is a large overlap like top you have a large uca coupling and if there is a small overlap so you have a small coupling essentially but uh, still you, there have some retrovic position test essentially so the actual bulk rs is a model which is much more complicated which is left right symmetric model in the bulk okay with lot of particles and stuff like that where it has a custodial symmetry so, uh, all of them have kk modes <laughs> all these particles everything but now the symmetry is much larger you don't have the standard model symmetry you have a much larger symmetry and then there are a lot of techniques which are interesting like you can break the symmetry by boundary conditions you, we talked about boundary conditions like right? so you s break the symmetry by some of these bond boundary conditions we have seen that they don't satisfy mm. the equations of motions and everything so you can break the symmetry by choosing appropriate uh, it is an old idea this is by shirts shirt actually shirt is a very very smart guy okay there's something called the shirt schwartz mechanism mm. and then the shirt okay shirt is the one who resected is a resurrected string theory actually he was the one who found that the strings have a uh, spin to solution always if you take a spin uh, a string like particle and write an equation of motion uh, along its whole line it will always have a spin to solution essentially so that's the reason why he said that it should be applied to gravity and they were the ones later on uh, okay green and schwartz found anomaly cancellation and everything but shirt schwartz did all the basic stuff essentially on string theory essentially and uh, Sure, also wrote down the full supergravity Lagrangian in eleven dimensions, horrendous calculations. <laughs> okay, yeah. Anyway, so one can use all these uh, string theory things, but in field theory language, essentially, you don't have to do this kind of calculation. So I just tell you the some results, and uh, what do you want to listen after RS extra dimensions? Uh, what else you want to listen? I have two more lectures to do. You want I can bore you with extra dimensions <laughs> forever, or you want to listen about two X doublet models or further things or something else. What do you want to listen? Then I'll plan my le lectures accordingly. Or relaxial models or cosmological models. Or what do you want? Two H two M S P. Okay. The next two lectures I'll. U V I R D R T. No, U V I R. Mixing, yeah. okay, that happens in certain theories essentially. So that is actually a, uh, it. Ha uh, that means in any theory in which there is something called the decoupling theorem. Okay, uh, Apoquist Carazon uh, 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 decoupling theorem. Okay, that theorem tells you that uh, UV physics should not come in IR. But there are a lot of exceptions to it. There are a lot of uh, exceptions to it, and uh, especially if you have a scalar field with derivative couplings and so on, so it will be sensitive to it. Uh, one of the things which is UVIR mixing is essentially the the Higgs mass itself. Okay, it is sensitive to new physics at higher scale. Essentially. But if you do dimensional regularization, it's not. You say that you don't see that evidently, but if you have an extra particle with a mass, even with dimensional regularity. Uh, regularization it is sensitive to the mass that's what we showed essentially UVIR mixing is essentially in that direction okay if you have so the basic idea now is that we want to see this UVIR mixing also in terms of amplitudes okay you know in terms of into amplitudes essentially that's the basic idea of uh, Arkani Hamad and company essentially <coughs> and the dualities you are talking about is not in Four dimensional theories, and uh, not in ordinary quantum field theories. The dualities which you are talking about, T loop dualities and everything, which have been found recently, uh, that that is in terms of amplitudes. Okay, there are some uh, loop amplitudes which you can just get in terms of the tree level amplitudes. If you know the tree level amplitudes, which are given in terms of this massless. Uh, amplitude techniques essentially in terms of this simple mm -hmm. formulas, right? Essentially, mm -hmm. one to one to two, one to one, one to two, helicity amplitudes. 
sum of the loop level amplitudes are equal to, uh, can be written in terms of the tree level amplitudes. So if you know the tree level amplitudes, you can tell what is the loop amplitude also. But that is in highly supersymmetric theories. This has been found by Lance Dixon and company. There is a nice uh, review by him. Okay, but that would require uh, some lectures on amplitude techniques essentially. <laughs> so amplitude techniques, I don't know, maybe Aninda can teach or something, I don't know. Uh, he has taught in standard model amplitude techniques, I don't know. But they are very simple. Uh, just like what we did in the initial uh, supersymmetry theory with uh, sigma matrices mm -hmm. and everything. It's very simple actually. Maybe, maybe next semester I'll do that. Okay, for me also it's good actually. <laughs> I'll just find some time and then tell that, okay, in the next semester. But, uh, okay, uh, Thursday and Friday I'll do two HD. Okay, yeah. Okay, so let me just then summarize the results with uh, um, RS models, actually. So the status of RS models. So if you have gauge fields, minus root g and then one by four. Now you put gauge fields in the bulk. So you put two metrics because they are tensor fields. Okay, F million, F million. And then it could is, uh, this is for U1. Okay, just for given you can do it essentially. Okay. Um, actually, there is a, okay. When you do this, you solve this and everything. You do the KK decomposition and everything. There is one thing in extra dimensions which I could do it, but I could never do it. So these, finally, you will end up with profiles of the gauge fields. It's just fun. So the gauge fields have a constant profile in the back. Just like what we have seen, uh, like, a, uh, like uh, even this is for normalized. For normalized gauge fields also, they are delocalized completely in the back. So that's the reason why they are very sensitive to all the corrections and everything. Okay. They are delocalized. But the higher modes, KN mode, KK mode, again, localized towards I have. <coughs> there is one lecture notes which I suggest uh, you guys to do it. It's called gauge with mean gauge field in the bulk, the fifth component of the gauge field can be thought of as a scalar. It comes out to be a scalar, right? Essentially. Okay. okay. If you have a mu, a mu phi or a mu phi phi can be a scalar. The basic idea is that this can be the Higgs. So the Higgs, Higgs will be a family. So this can be used again to solve the hierarchy problem. It doesn't work. Okay. It's a different mu. So this symmetry, the pi dimensional gauge symmetry, can protect the Higgs. Okay, uh, this is covered very well by in uh, the lecture notes of Tasi by Randall, no, by Sundaram. I to the fifth dimension or something. I don't know. In fact, the gauge field is massless to begin with. So the Higgs is massless, but one loop corrections which are finite give mass to the Higgs. So this is called by the name Hosatani mechanism. By the Japanese guy called Hosatani. It's a very, very interesting. It's 
escenario. Now that you reminded me, I, I'm telling you this thing. So this is also one way of solving the hierarchy problem, actually. This is a finite correction, and uh, it involves very interesting mathematics, actually, to show that the one loop corrections to the Higgs in the full thing comes out to be finite, actually. Uh, just work out. It is done in gory details completely by Sundaram. OK? Just for lectures, he gives this link, actually, with a U1 example, with a U1 example. So just for fun, you can do it actually. So then, I look at four. Okay. So this is the side remark. And fermions in the bulk. You have fermions. Fermions, I am not putting any gauge interactions. Even without gauge interactions, you will have fermions having a covariant derivative because they are in gravity. The background is classical gravity, essentially. Okay? So, this will be uh, the covariant derivative would be something which is called the spin connection. connection for this geometry is this, this you can get it from Friedman actually. You get it from Friedman by writing down what is the uh, Christopher symbols and Friedman and Friedman's in terms of Christopher symbols and then the capital gamma will be also be related to the three points. Because the flat space gamma matrices are different compared to the curved space gamma matrices. Okay, this you can easily study in Mukno. Mukno has it, right, essentially. Mukno has, uh, you know this book by Mukno? It's a, one of the easiest books on gravity. Uh, it's called Quantum Field Theory on Curved uh, Classical Gravity quantum field theory on classical backgrounds. It, uh, it's PDF is available with many people, I think. Classical backgrounds. Now you could do the KK reduction and everything. When you do the KK reduction, what do you get for the zero modes? So after normalization and everything, for the zero mode, okay. <coughs> after the uh, okay, the left-handed parts, which are the standard model parts, okay. After the canonical normalization, 
They are given by some normalization factor e power half minus c sigma of the canonical normalization. Okay, so these are your wave functions in the canonical basis. So that means, depending upon your bulk mass parameter, you are localize your wave function anywhere you want essentially in the bulk. Okay, this is order one essentially. Choosing because it's an exponential thing. You can localize it anywhere you want. When c is equal to half completely delocalized, okay, because it's zero, it's completely delocalized. If c is greater than half, it is uh, localized on the uh, UV brain. If c is less than half, it's localized on the IR brain. So you have profiles in the in the in the Randall syndrome model. So where you can localize it here, when c is less than half, you can localize it here, when c is greater than half, and it's completely flat profile when c is less than half. That's the point. So what you do is, because you have left-handed fields like this, so light fields, you localize them on the UV, so that they have if you put the Higgs localized very close to the IR, Higgs. So the total you cover coupling would be this wave function times this wave function plus right handed field wave function. Okay? So the Yukawa coupling would be combination of the wave function of the left field, the wave function of the right field, and the wave function of the Higgs. Now Higgs is localized on the IR brain. It has to be localized because you want to solve that hierarchy problem. So you put it here. So, for the light fields, you want zero overlap with the Higgs fields. So, like neutrinos or something, electron, you localize them dominantly on the UV brain. And top part kind of everything, you localize them very close to the IR brain, essentially. Which has a large Yukawa coupling, Yukawa coupling, the other one. Okay? So, this model also has something called the RS gene mechanism. Gene mechanism, but it doesn't really have a custodial symmetry. But you can ma modify, you can manage the electron equation test such that uh, your lambda is around 4 to 5 meters. 4 to 5 meters. You can somehow manage, you can fine tune it and everything. Research in RS is that RS, none of the RS KK modes can be found in LHC unless you do something with the electron equation test. So, the models which do electron uh, significantly models, which are something called where you modify the geometry of the IR brain, okay, those are the models which have some hope of seeing some particles or some black hole, RS black holes at LHC. Otherwise, the reason why there is no interest in RS right now is because you cannot retro equation test tell you that the minimum KK mode is beyond the reach of LHC. Except in certain very, very fine-tuned models essentially, in which you change the IR brain, delocalize the IR brain and so on. So you soften it and everything. Okay, that's the situation. So it is now used more like a theory of flavor, okay, where you localize all these things and study what are the processes for mu going to e gamma, tau going to e gamma. Those are the kind of things you have. So it's more like an RS theory. So or K0, K0 bar, what is the situation with our K0, K0 bar and so on and so So RS has modified itself as a theory of flavor. So, yeah, it's a very, very interesting idea, RS. So, um, I also advise you to read the recent uh, snow mass report on RS models. Okay. So, 
So this is done by, again, Pratik Agrawal and company essentially, Sundaram, Randall and company, just have a look at that. Uh, it is still a very good idea, but it looks like uh, at least at the level of LHC, it's very hard to realize that essentially, at the level of LHC. Any questions? You want more details on RSA? I can tell you, I just will tell you. Yeah. Any questions, comments on RS models? Or so RS is more interesting from theory point of view because it's like a playbook for uh, ADS QCD. So ADS QCD, if you want to solve QCD, okay, RS is a very good starting point because it uh, the RS has all the features as ADS CFT and string theory, but except that it is QCD, okay? So you can actually calculate uh, correlators, one-to-one -one correspondence. You can build the entire RS, uh, ADS CFT dictionary for RS. So now there are two main branches. Say, for example, to solve G minus two or something, you're using RS to calculate hydronic. So it's like an alternative to uh, lattice, essentially, because now you can use ADS QCD build realistic models of ADS QCD like Sakai, Sugumoto and there are various models essentially. Okay, of ADS QCD and compute things which like current current correlators and stuff like that, which are computable in the non perturbative level only in RS because you can actually use RS as a, a computational tool for non perturbative physics. Okay, because now you can use the weak strong duality and everything essentially. The other thing is like theory of flavor. So ADS QCD is still going strong. People have computed hydraulic uh, vacuum polarization in RS QCD models. QCD models based on RS backgrounds and stuff. Okay. So I don't think it will die down RS because mainly because it's a computational tool. For flavor, for flavor it's equivalent to doing it for uh, say flavor models of Provartensen and so on and so on. You can show one to one correspondence with that. So that's the reason why it's interesting. It's still, that's the reason why there is still some interest in RS models. Okay. So even though you don't find any signatures for it, but it's now more used for a technological, pur theoretical technological purpose for computing non portable physics and stuff like that. And that's the reason also why I covered this in this lecture session.